The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Jim Feifenberger uh, talking to you from up in Seward, Alaska, and I want to welcome you all to the first uh, of a quarterly webinar series. Um, it's a webinar series that's going to focus on ocean-related science, and our goal is to get some of the latest in ocean science out in front of you folks to make you better informed as resource managers or better informed as interpreters or whatever it is that your job is just to make you better stewards of uh, the ocean, which is something that uh, we have a, all a great deal of concern and interest in, um, particularly in the, the group that brings you this. The, the webinar is brought to you by a group called POET. That stands for the Pacific Ocean Education Team. We're a group of National Park Service uh, interpreters primarily. Um, but we have, I think we have one resource person on our group. If you're interested in joining the POET group, feel free to contact uh, me um, after the webinar. Um, and we can uh, certainly clue you into our, our regular meetings and so forth. But uh, our plan right now is to bring in these webinars once every quarter. So this is the first one. That would mean our next one will be sometime in late June. And we'll certainly keep you all informed uh, when that one comes up. We don't have a speaker identified yet, but we do have a lot of potentially good topics uh, coming your way and uh, we're pleased to see so many in attendance today. Before we get started I'm going to turn it over to John Morris briefly to give us just a little technical information about the webinar system, how you can ask questions and how you can interact with the webinar and I, I do want to thank John in advance for all his help in setting this up uh, from the technical side and making this possible. So uh, John, give us a little technical info, please. You're very welcome, Jim. Yeah, this is uh, John Morris again. And uh, basically, for anyone who's new to the webinar series, it's pretty simple. When you come in as an attendee, you're in listen-only mode. And because there's so many attendees, we can't really control the audio very well but to um, mute you. So your main way to communicate with us is just to type your questions or comments in the chat box there at the bottom of your control panel. It says questions, actually. Uh, we just type it in there, send them to us. If it's a comment for the whole group to see, we'll kind of send, uh, send it out to everybody so they can see it. If it's a question specifically for the speaker, we'll hold it for the question and answer period at the end. Uh, but you can certainly type in questions and comments at any time. And if you want to watch that comment box, uh, we'll be sending out messages throughout the session as well. Um, so I think that's it. Also, the only other issues that come up with the webinar technology typically are problems with audio. It is bandwidth dependent, so if there's bandwidth issues going on, occasionally the audio drops out. Don't panic; it'll pop back in again. It doesn't take, uh, it doesn't go long, go out for long if that happens. Uh, if you're dialing and listening to the phone, listening to the information over the phone, and you have a bad connection, oftentimes folks just hang up and and dial in again, and it, it resolves that problem. So, other than that, you shouldn't have any issues with the technical side of things. If uh, if you do encounter problems, uh, send just a, type me a message, and I'll I'll assist. So I'll turn it back over to Jim, and thanks you all for, for attending. Okay, thank you, John. And John did uh, make reference to the fact that we will have a question and answer session uh, at the end of the webinar, and um, we'll be sort of uh, reading any questions that get typed in so that everyone can hear them and giving our speaker a chance to answer those uh, audibly. So uh, we will get to have that as sort of a group uh, event to the question and answer part. So. At this point, I want to introduce Bonnie Phillips, who is uh, down at Cabrillo National Monument in uh, San Diego, and she is going to introduce our speaker. She's part of the POET group, so take away, Bonnie. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're very excited today to welcome our guest presenter. Uh, he's here to discuss his latest research with acoustics and marine mammal populations. Uh, so to get right to it, without further ado, here is Dr. John Hildebrand from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. John. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Bonnie and Jim and everybody else at the Park Service for including me as part of your, uh, your community of, of poets. And um, so that what I want to talk about is what you learn by listening to marine mammals, you know, by, by essentially putting your ear in the water and, and <clears throat> you know, how that can be complementary to the kind of studies you do with visuals with a pair of binoculars. And, and you know that uh, if you've done work on marine mammals, that they really spend, they have to spend some time at the ocean, you know, to come up and, and take a breath because they are air breathers. But most of their lives are spent under the water. And what we need is a window 
to see what it is that's that's taking place down under the water and and because of the um, the physics of the way sound propagates under the ocean relative to light, sound is sort of the preferred mode of communication and also of sensing the, the marine environment. And so marine mammals have adapted ways of using sound, and they make sort of ubiquitous use of sound. And, and we can tap into that. We're eavesdropping on their lives to, to learn you know, a, a lot more about the behavior that's hidden to us uh, when they're submerged. So I've been working on this topic for about, you know, 25 years or so, um, not, not as intensively in the, as the last 10. And, and it's really been uh, moved forward by the technology for making underwater uh, recordings. We've been able to do things now that we couldn't do 10 or 15 years ago in terms of capturing uh, underwater sounds. So let's see, I'm going to learn about, OK. So now, um, what is it that we really need to know, um, you know in terms of studying these animals? You know, what are some of the key parameters we'd like to figure out? And to first order, we just need to know where they are distributed. You know, what is their uh, location you know, around, the, around the planet? How many are there? What are the patterns of their behavior, either seasonally as they migrate, or daily as they go through a cycle of foraging or resting or socializing. And so, um, and then, you know, more details of their behavior. How do they behave as individuals or as a group? And then ultimately, we'd like to be able to say what the impact of things that people are doing, making sound, um, using vessels, um, you know, discharge of, of various toxics, and what are all of these influences? How do they impact? The animals, and in then that's a feedback to us to say, well, if if we want to protect them, we need to cut down on you know these kind of activities, or at least be sensitive to how those will impact the, the marine mammals. So, um, because this is a talk about sound, I think I wanted to start out just giving you some examples of what the sounds um, are like. And now um, there there are really these two classes. I'm I'm shortchanging. Um, pinnipeds in this, but in terms of cetaceans, there are two main classes of marine mammals. There are mysticetes, which are whales that have baleen, and they're basically you know, filter feeding uh, foragers. And then there are tooth whales, or odontocetes, which have teeth and actively uh, you know, go after their prey. And so because of these different styles of, of foraging and, and also you know, sort of their whole approach to, to life, there are different kinds of sounds that these uh, animals make. And, and the most famous of all the, the cetacean sounds are the, the songs of, of whales, of large whales. And so I'm going to play just a little piece now of a song from humpback whale. And I, I call this a tone and moan. <laughs> So I, I hope that, that you could hear that. And um, so the, the humpback songs are used by males as a way of advertising their fitness for breeding. And, and they're famous as songs because they're structured in a way, they're patterned sounds that we perceive them as being a song. We perceive them as, as having a, a, um, a, a pattern that, that then conveys some information. Um, and, and so they're, they're famous because in the 60s, there were uh, people that could take these sounds and, and turn them into to phonograph albums. I remember this is my first exposure to whales as a, as a child, listening to um, an album of songs of the humpback whales. And, and that helped people to connect to the animals in terms of the conservation efforts that were going on at that point. So for Adonisites, it's a totally different world of sound production. And they have a specialized anatomy that I'll talk about in, in just a few slides about how they make sounds and how they receive sounds. But the primary thing for adonisites is to be able to sense the environment with a click, which is for uh, echolocation. That is making a, a, an estimate of the range between the animal and some object underwater. So here are a series of these echolocation clicks. 
sort of sounds like a, a creaky door. I mean, that sequence was a whole series of clicks sent out uh, together. And, and the timing of the clicks tells you about you know, the distance to some object. Now, you can, if you make the clicks in a rapid enough sequence, they actually sound more like a buzz. And, um, and Ken Norris, who's a very famous uh, whale researcher, once described these series of buzzes as the Yugoslavian news report. And, and what he was trying to get across with that is that if, if you read the Yugoslavian news report and you don't actually, you know, if you have no idea of the, the language, you know that there's information being portrayed, but you don't understand what it is. And, and that's a sense for this that it's, it's probably the, the way that uh, the animals are communicating because there's just a complexity of the, of the modulation of these sounds. But, but we don't, at this point, understand you know, the meaning of it. So here are these, some buzzes. So in, and then the final bit of the Adonisite um, communication has to do with whistles. And we know from captive animals that there tend to be a signature that an individual animal will have a characteristic whistle that it learns um, you know, as a juvenile, and that it, it's probably used as a way of identifying individuals. So these are, uh, would be a signature whistle. Which is that particular one uh, from a bottlenose is fairly high frequency for, for a human hearing. So, so just to talk about the sort of ranges of whales, off the Southern California coast, we have a really diverse set of, of whales. And, and it's one of the best places to be exposed to some of the lor large animals, like blue whales and, and humpback whales. And, and in the same token, we have almost the entire population of, of gray whales moving, at least uh, the northeast Pacific gray whales, moving past our door sort of twice uh, in a season. So, um, so how is it that these large animals can produce sound? And, uh, what we know is they're, they're mammals like us. They're breathing air. And, and the mechanism that they have to produce sound is actually amazingly similar to the way we produce sound. We produce sound by pushing air out of our lungs past our larynx, which, which is an element that, that vibrates. And then it picks up the character of our voice from the shape of our tongues and inside of our throat and, and mouth. Well, for a whale, if you look at this, this image, the red is the respiratory tract of the whale. And, and the red going back you know, aft toward the whale will lead to the lungs. And then there's a, a tube that comes up uh, toward the blowhole, you know, which is the path, of course, that the air is, you know, when the animal is filling its lungs, the air is coming down from that uh, blowhole. And then there's a structure where there's a, literally a sac, which we think is used to receive the, the air which is a laryngeal sac. And, and we think that the process of making a sound is moving air from the lungs into the laryngeal sac. And there are a series of, of sort of ridges that, that would start the, the actual vibration. But when, when uh, people have observed, in particular, humpbacks underwater calling, there's no exhalation of the air. The air is, is kept. And you, that would make sense because you know, as uh, deep diving animals, you don't want to be expelling air. So, so laryngeal sac is a way of, of holding on to the air that's used in the production of a sound. So now in the next slide, this is the physicist's view of the sound production of a whale. On the left here, you see are the lungs, which have some large volume of air. And then there's this oscillating valve where when air is pushed out of the lungs and then into the laryngeal sac in this, this pliant membrane, um, that that's the process of, of making a call. And then with this rigid tube, it's almost like an organ pipe that goes up into the skull of the animal, may have a role in, in enhancing the resonance of the sound. So, um, so these, this is a, a way the animals have evolved to make these very powerful uh, low frequency sounds. Now I started, uh, this is a little more than 10 years ago, trying to make long term recordings of, of baleen whale sounds, mostly just off the coast of California here, but in other areas like the Southern Ocean and, and up in the Bering Sea. Um, and um, so we, at that point, we found that we could sample at about a one kilohertz sample rate, which is a reasonably, it's about the middle of human hearing sort of sample rate. Um, but we could make recordings 
continuous uh, digital recordings for a year. And this was really a powerful mechanism to collect the sound of these animals. And so this is a, an image, uh, an aerial shot of a blue whale in the Southern California area. It's coming, they come north uh, from um, the Costa Rica area to off the coast of Southern California for feeding. And uh, when they arrive, what we found is that there were two main classes of sounds that they would make. The upper panel shows parts of a blue whale song. And very imaginatively, um, I didn't make this up, but the, the parts of the song were called A and B. There's an A, which is a pulse sound, which I'm showing now. And then followed uh, about a minute later was a tonal sound that is called a B. And if you put a recorder out off Southern California, you'll get an order of 90,000 of these repetitions of the song you know, in, a, in a recording for a year. So there's a substantial you know, volume of, of the singing that you'd hear almost, almost anywhere you want to put a recorder off the Southern California coast. And um, the other kinds of sounds we found were these what we call D calls or downswept calls. And these are much more irregular. And they tended to be done in sequences of, of call and counter call between individual animals. And, and what we learned mostly by uh, putting recording tags on the animals themselves, and I'll show you that in a second, is that the, the song calls are made by males exclusively, whereas the D calls, the, the contact calls, are made both by males and by females. And this is an example of a, a recording tag. Um, and you see here's the, a blue whale, the side of a blue whale. And uh, my friend Mark McDonald with a pole about to place a, a suction cup tag on the side of the animal. And here's in the context of the, the, the back of the animal, you can see our tag looks pretty small uh, compared to the, the, the scale of the animal here. And um, after a certain period of time, what, one of our goals was to say, what fraction of the time are animals calling? And so, so out of 24 deployments, we found a, that six of the 24 times we would get calls. So about 25% of the time, the animals are, if you record for an hour or more, you'll, you'll get the animals making some kind of call. Now here's an example of a sequence of, you know, we're showing the depth of the animal from a pressure gauge and then time of day along the lower axis. And so what, after tagging the animal, this was done sort of in the afternoon just off of uh, La Jolla here, the animals are diving down to a couple hundred meters depth. And then at the bottom of the dive, there are some lunges that, where the animal is, is feeding on a layer of, of krill that's aggregated. This is actually down near the seafloor. And, and um, the, the colored dots are times where the animal is making some kind of sound. And so the, um, the red dots and the blue dots are these parts of the, uh, the AB song. And you can see while the animal is actively feeding, it's not calling. And then as the sun is going down and the krill layer is coming up, the animal is diving to shallower depths to follow that. But, but during the night, it's pretty much stopped feeding. It's spending a lot of time near the surface, probably resting um, in a lot of these shallow dives. And then interspersed with that, it's making these song calls. So, so you see this sort of complementary behavior of diving deep and feeding and not making sound and being shallow near the surface and in, you know, in a different behavioral state where they are making sound. Now, one of the advantages of calling near the surface is that that's where the animal actually has a, a lung full of air. The, the pressure, the compression of, of deep diving means that down here at 200 meters, there's very little air left to make the call. So, so in retrospect, we did anticipate this, but once we'd seen this pattern, that the animals really only make sound near the surface. It makes sense in terms of the air that they have available for the calling. Um, this is an example of the D calls. And here, there are feeding dives. I mentioned these sort of lunges at the bottom of the dive, down deep, you know, below 200 meters. But when they go back up to the surface, there are these D calls are done interspersed with the feeding dives. And, and um, if you look at this panel on the right, there's a call made by the tagged animal, and then a call made by, that's, that's lower in, in, uh, in volume here, made by an adjacent animal. So these calls are basically used as a way of keeping track of each other 
it's like screaming, you know, or yelling out, "Here I am!" There you are, back and forth, you know, in between the the, the feeding dives. So when we plot these two different kinds of calls on a cycle of their um, seasonal, you know, presence, this is four years of data off of the Southern California coast. The animals are further south, off of uh, Central America and Mexico in the in the uh, spring, and they arrive in California in sort of late spring, early summer. And when they arrive there's a real preponderance of the D calls, which are the feeding calls. So they've come up to the feeding grounds. Sure enough, the calls associated with feeding are, are really dominate their behavior. And then as the season goes on, there's more and more song, you know, and less and less of the feeding calls. And so by October, which is the time where we think that they're starting to pair up you know, for mating, that the song is, is really the dominant thing that they're doing. So, so there's this whole cycle of, different sounds that are associated with, with different behaviors. Um, now, when we started to, to get data on um, these song calls, we wanted to be a little more quantitative on you know, what actually was the, the, uh, the frequency and duration and all these kind of measures. And, and one thing we realized, uh, we started collecting data quite intensively here at about the year 2000, that each year the frequency measured by the pitch of this uh, tonal call, even though the call looked more or less the same, the frequency was shifting down just a little bit. And if you measure the third harmonic here, it shifts down um, not quite half a hertz per year. And, you know, and this plot just goes on and on. They're, they've shifted down you know, um, quite a bit over the time where we've been monitoring. But if you go all the way back to the 60s where the Navy had data, the, the the, it's almost a 30 percent uh, decrease in the pitch of this sound from the earliest Navy recordings in the 60s to the recordings we make today. And so, so this was puzzling and we, we had to really scratch our heads and work on a theory for why this would be. And, and the best thing we can come up with is that this is a response to the fact that, that uh, there was quite a diminishing of, of density of these animals in the whaling era. So in the 60s when the first recordings were made, the animals were right on the brink of um, you know, the, the, the impact of, the, of the, the whaling. You know, it really reduced the numbers to a small fraction of their, their original uh, carrying capacity. And since that time, we know from survey data and other things that the numbers of animals have been increasing. And so, so basically, this, this shift in frequency, we think, is related to the need to signal the song, have the song project to a sufficient number of animals. If you're a male here in the middle and you want to attract a mate, there, you have to project your song out to enough distance that, that the females will hear you. And it turns out, by increasing the frequency, it's a little counterintuitive, but by increasing the frequency of the call, you can actually make a louder, a, a more intense call than you can at low frequency. Now, that also begs the question, well, why wouldn't you just keep the call high frequency forever? And in, to this, there must be some pressure, some selective pressure that says that if you can both make a low frequency and a um, high intensity call, then, then that would give you some advantage in terms of the, the, uh, the breeding. And so, so that that's our, our conjecture. It took us actually, oh boy, almost six years to get a paper published um, on this, and it's still a little bit controversial, but in the process, we started to look at blue whale song around the planet. And so here's an example of the one I was just showing you off of California, but there's a different song off of uh, South America. Um, Here's an example off of New Zealand, and you know each area there's a sort of a biogeography of, of blue whale song, and so the numbers show areas where we have recordings of a distinctive style of singing, and so the animals I've been talking about off of California migrate back and forth along the west coast of North America, and then there's a pelagic version out in deep water here in the North Pacific. There's a, a coastal version in South America. There's an Antarctic version. So we came up with nine song types at the time we did this. We've actually found a new one. There's a tenth one over here that we didn't know at the time this paper was published. But um, 
And when we looked at all of these blue whale songs worldwide and got as many, as many recordings as we could, what we found is that every instance where we could find recordings over you know, a few decades, we would see a downward shift in the frequency of the, of the songs. So, so I guess, I mean, I see this as a happy story that probably all of these different stocks of blue whales are, are recovering. But, um, but there's a certain mystery in, in terms of how, you know, globally they're all, you know, doing this, this same uh, behavior. So, um, so now I want to talk about the difference between what you learn from surveying, you know, with acoustics and what you learn with surveying with visuals. And, and one of the things is that um, there's a different style of the, uh, the survey for these two modes. And, and imagine here's a box, and we'd like to know uh, how many blue whales or, or any kind of marine mammal are inside this box. And typically with a visual survey, we'd, we'd conduct a line transect survey where we would go and, in, and uh, take some sort of platform and as rapidly as possible assess how many animals we see along these track lines, and then use that estimate along the track lines as a, as a, um, a way to, to predict how many whales are in the larger box. Well, the difference with acoustics, it's, it's usually best to conduct acoustics with some sort of long-term recording, which means that you're sitting at one spot. You're not covering the whole area, but you can get data not from just one snapshot, but from all the seasons. You can do this for months or, or even years at a time. So there's sort of a time and space mismatch between these two styles of surveying. So to, to force the visual surveys to be on the same kind of uh, you know, uh, um, spatial and temporal scales as the acoustics, I, I conducted this, this project where we took the research platform FLIP, which is basically it's a buoy that you can take out and moor. And on the top of the FLIP, there's a platform which is, is 25 meters above the waterline, which has the greatest view of the ocean that you'll ever get. And, and I had marine mammal visual observers sit on this platform at the same time that we made acoustic recordings around the flip. And, and it just happened that we had an aggregation of fin whales that, that stayed with us for, for a couple of weeks. And we used the visual observers to cue a, a tagging effort. So we put our tags on the backs of these fin whales and from the tags, we could see that um, the animals were diving down and foraging, again, near the bottom. And, and we could make a, a, a little um, pie chart of the time they spent at the surface, going down, at the bottom feeding, and then coming back up. And you can see from this pie chart, they're spending a lot of time. When they're deep foraging like this, there's a lot of time at or near the surface, which means that it's re reasonably uh, straightforward to spot them while they're in this feeding mode. But from all of the animals we tagged, which were six whales, we didn't get a single recall. On the other hand, the recorders that we had around the flip were full of fin whale calls. And this is an example. Fin whales make little pulses that are low frequency, sort of um, anywhere from about 15 to, to you know, 30, 40 hertz. And the pulses tend to be done in these call, counter call sort of sequences. And you can we could localize individual pulses so we could say the numbers on the bottom here actually tell us a, an individual animal that's making a call. So this is animal number one, and then here's animal number one, we'll call again later. So the, this sequence has three animals that are in a, a call counter call sort of sequence. And when we plotted the, the locations, what we would see is that the calling typically made a track through the area. Here are our acoustic sensors, these red circles. And so the calling animals are just swimming through the animal as they're making sound. Um, and when we compared what we saw with what we heard, the circles, this is a, a sighting, and then here are some calls. But, but here's a surfacing, a break in the calling that, that the visual observers actually didn't see. And then here's a sighting you know, that, that they did get, and here, then here's one they missed. So, so only about half the time of, are the surfacing of the calling animals actually being seen by the visual observers. And if you take the whole aggregate of the data from you know, 11 days and you plot, now this is just spatially, where were, did we see animals from the top of flip? It was in the northeast quadrant of our study area. And then if you plot where we heard the animals, it was all 
off to the, to the west of our study area. There's almost no overlap between where we saw them and where we heard them, which, which led me to make this diagram, which says that there are basically two behavioral states. There's a state where it's relatively straightforward to see them, but in that state, they won't be making very many calls. And then there's a state where they're calling, but it's very difficult to see them. And the overlap between these is very small, which says that you really need both of these techniques to, uh, to, to do an adequate job of, of studying these animals. It's, it's only in certain behavioral states that you'll get them you know, with one mode or the other. So now um, I want to move on to the small cetaceans. And by um, expanding the bandwidth of our recordings where we could get the, the echolocation clicks of, the, of these uh, tooth whales, we were able to study a whole new variety of species and from as large as the sperm whale but down to things like common dolphins and uh, bottlenose dolphins. And there's a specialized anatomy that um, adonisites have, have created to both produce the sounds and to, to receive the sounds. They've made a fat body on their foreheads that sits just in front of the, the blowhole in the respiratory tract. And the, the actual sound is made by some constrictions that are at the back of this fat body, which is called the melon. And, um, and these restrictions, it's, it's basically passing air through a, a tight gap will make this sort of click or a series of clicks. The sound is projected out of the forehead of the animal as a collimated beam. And then when it's received, it's received by a fat body that's along the jaw of the animal. This is much like our external ear, but it's a, but it's a fat body that collects the sounds and then leads it back to the, to the uh, cochlea where it's detected. So, so it's a specialized anatomy for producing sound that goes forward in a flashlight beam and then receiving that sound uh, again directionally you know, along the jaw. Now, um, we upped our sample rate to 200 kilohertz. We'd actually like to go a little higher than this. This is way ultrasonic, way higher than what people can hear. Um, we could now then only get, um, this number is up to about 100 days of continuous recording with a few terabytes of data storage. I mean, the, the, the um, volumes of data we're collecting are large, but, but on the other hand, the technology keeps moving forward to make it possible to deal with these kind of volumes. So, so when we went out and started recording Adonisites off of Southern California, um, here are two that we found immediately that there was a characteristic to the echolocation clicks. So, so this is Rizzo's dolphin on the left here. It's sort of this gray, whitish looking animal with a very blunt head. And then these are Pacific white-sided dolphins uh, where, you, where you see this white on the dorsal fin and a white on the underbody. And, and it, what we've done is we've stacked up several thousand of the echolocation clicks of each of these animals. And now the sounds go all the way up to 100 kilohertz here. And you can see that there are lines of high amplitude and low amplitude that characterize these clicks. And, and you can see the difference just by looking at these two plots. Once you know um, the characteristics, you can say that animals at 30 kilohertz, that have a, a line at 30 kilohertz here, are, are Rizzo's. And that line is absent in the white-sided. You know, they have a, a line that's higher and a line that's slightly lower. So we use this as a way of doing the species ID for these guys when there's no observer present. I mean, first we had to get a lot of recordings in the presence of the animal, but having done that, now we can take unattended recordings and, and say something about the animals. And, and then the other thing we realized is that even within the Pacific white-sided animals, there were subtle differences. You can see there's a slight shift in that upper line that we realized that there were two ecotypes there's a, that we've labeled type A and type B. Um, that you can spot in the acoustics that, that's impossible to spot in the field. There may be um, both genetic and morphological indications of it on stranded animals, but you can actually easily do this field ID with the acoustics. So, so we had a series of uh, deployments here off the Southern California coast where we tried to, to get long-term uh, recordings. And this is an example of the data. This is an hour of data. Um, a spectrogram, so this is the frequency on this axis, the time on this axis, and just by looking at the position of these lines, we can say, aha, this is the passage of a group of Rizzo's dolphins, and on this side, you can see we have the 
uh, type B um, white-sided dolphins and then the type A white-sided dolphins. That one group, you know, passed off the baton to the next group at this particular site, you know, over the span of an hour. Now, from about two years of recording, if you take the average, if you ask within a one-hour window, do we hear Rizzo's dolphins or not? These pie charts show you the probability of encountering Rizzo's dolphins. So at the south end of Catalina Island, about three quarters of the time, you know, in a one hour, if you wait for an hour, you'll hear a Rizzo's dolphin. And then as you see, as you go offshore, they're quite sparse. And so what we found for Rizzo's is sort of an island-associated uh, population. And then if you take the echolocation clicks and you bend them up into time of day, and this is in GMT, but this is the nighttime, here's Here's the sunset and here's the sunrise. Um, we see that most of the clicking takes place at night, which immediately tells us that these are nighttime foragers. They're using the echolocation clicks to, as, as part of their hunting repertoire. And in fact, we know that they're, they're squid-eating animals and that the squid tend to be more accessible for hunting at night. So, so there's a lot of behavioral information just in this plot of when they're making their echolocation clicks and the, the time of minimum clicking is sort of in the afternoon, which is probably their time for resting. Now, for the white-sided dolphins, we found a different kind of pattern. Here are the type A animals, which we surmise to be sort of a northern ecotype, and the type B, which is overlapped, but we need recordings further south, but we, we conjecture that these are animals that go from Southern California south into Mexico. And the percentage that the animals are present at these various sites is shown in the, the little um, pie charts. And again, there's some association with the islands, but there's also an offshore uh, presence of the animals. And now when we bend them up in terms of time of day, what we found was a, a, a totally different pattern between the two ecotypes. The A type, which is the northern type, was again a nighttime forager like Rizzo's dolphin. But the B type had suppressed calling at night and more clicking during the day. So we would say these are, are probably a daytime forager. And this may actually explain partly how you could have the overlap of these two animals in essentially the same uh, water space if they're foraging on different, uh, different prey. So, um, so this is all from the acoustics, you know, things that we're learning about more than just the animal is present, but things about you know, the actual uh, behavior of the animal. Now, I want to end with um, some sort of view into the future of the, the technology. And I mentioned how the acoustics are kind of you know, stuck at these certain uh, spots. And, and that's, that's bad, because we really would like to cover the whole terrain more along the lines of what's done with a visual survey. And the problem, and there, you can do that with a ship and towing an array. But, but that's expensive because you have to have the pay for the whole vessel and you know, people to be out on the vessel and specialists who are going to be out there. And so we would like to make acoustic measurements that are more like the uh, long-term you know, fixed site measurements. And the way that that's going to come about, which, which hasn't quite come to fruition, but I'm, I'm trying to peer into the future here, is with gliders and drifters. And I've listed a whole series of gliders that are under, either under development or things you can buy you know, today, like the Slocum or the Sea Glider. And, um, and the advantage of this approach is that you could put the, your acoustics on the glider. You can turn it loose, and autonomously, it will run a survey track, you know, a line transect survey, and then come back, and you can download the data, and then get a sense from the acoustic uh, point of view of what was out in this larger area. And that's, there's an advantage there by you know, covering spatially you know, the whole, whole terrain, because the animals are not uniformly distributed across the space. So, so I think this is, um, really has a lot of potential for the future. And the, the, the vehicle that I've been working with is called the Wave Glider. And this was developed by a, a company that's up in uh, Silicon Valley called Liquid Robotics. And they, um, they developed it with an idea of having a, uh, not having to put in a mooring, having a buoy that would hold station. But what they realized uh, eventually is that they had something that could harvest the energy of waves to, uh, to propel itself you know, through the water. And what we've done with the wave glider is 
into the, the surface flow to the wave glider, we've injected one of our acoustic recorders, we call these the harps, and we can make the same um, volume of, of recording on the glider as we can at a fixed site. So, um, and then we, on the, there's a wing b below this where we tell a hydrophone. So that's our, our uh, acoustic sensor. So, so a wave glider, it's, it's a very clever idea how this thing works. And, and it has to do with the fact that the wave motion is, is at the surface and then diminishes exponentially, you know, depending on the wavelength, with depth. And so the cleverness of this idea is to have a float that's at the surface that's going through a vertical excursion as each wave passes by, and then a wing that's submerged that's in more or less stable water. And so the, the wing is being pulled up and down by the surface float. So then the clever thing is to have the wing, if you spring load the wing, so it's sort of neutral in, in the middle, but on, on the upward cycle it takes a certain angle of attack, and then on the down cycle it takes the opposite angle of attack. So it keeps pushing itself in the same direction. And then there's a little rudder where you can actually choose you know, what direction that is. So it, it just keeps moving itself through the water. And so here's a picture of the whole device now. This black uh, uh, wire right here is the umbilical cord that connects the wing to the surface float. And the wing hangs down sort of eight meters below. But, um, but in the surface float now, we have solar panels for power. And we have an um, a Iridium uh, satellite phone for communication and a GPS antenna, so you know the position. And literally, the way that we've operated this from Scripps is to roll the device on a cart down to the end of the Scripps pier, put it in the water. Now, unfortunately, we have to have somebody get in the water to pull a pin to separate the, the surface float and the wing. But then we really, literally come back to our office and get onto the internet, and we know where the device is, and we can direct it off you know, to, a, to a new desired location, and, and away it goes. And the only uh, power it needs is to keep its electronics alive, which it gets from the solar cells. The, the actual power for moving it through the water comes from the wave action. So, um, so I think this is going to be really a, a game changing. This kind of device, you know, all of the gliders, will change the way that we uh, take data, not just for acoustics, but for other measurements as well, that there's going to be this autonomous presence in the ocean that we haven't had, um, you know, we've, we've had to send people out to see, which is, is fine, but it's, it's expensive. And so you can imagine, you know, thousands of these that are out surveying in the North Pacific, showing us the patterns of where the marine mammals are present and in areas that have been very ex inaccessible to us uh, so far. So I think there's a, a whole world that's going to open up of things that we'll learn uh, from these gliders. Now. Um, I wanted to point out, I have a, uh, a website that's been developed in collaboration with the Pacific Life Foundation. These are the guys that when you see the commercials of humpback whales, you know, jumping out of the water, these are the guys that, that have done that. But uh, this, this website called uh, voicesinthesea.org is we've tried to give examples of the sounds of, of all the marine mammals. But as well, we have little videos that will sort of introduce you to, you know, um, you know what are the, the uh, conservation issues, you know, as well as the, the, and how does the sound, you know, sort of feed into that. Now, this is also a, um, a museum exhibit that you can see um, at, at various locations, including uh, Aquarium in the Pacific at Long Beach, uh, the Seattle Aquarium, uh, the Aquarium in Atlanta, and the National Aquarium in uh, Washington, D.C. So, um, so anyway, so I hope you you go and explore this and you'll, you'll find various sounds and, and videos. And, and if you have any uh, questions or, or comments on this, I would, I would love to get some uh, feedback. So, so anyway, at, at this point, I'd, I'd be open to, uh, to questions or, or comments. Okay, thank you very much, John. This is Jim Pfeifenberger again. And uh, I have at least one question uh, that's come in on the uh, sort of comment board and so any of you out there who do have questions you can type them into that um, comments or questions board and we'll, we'll read them. So I'm going to start with the one here, John. It says, Regard, uh, regarding the call frequency decline, could the frequency be declining 
to compensate for increased global boat traffic noise in addition to population changes? Yeah, no, that, that is a really interesting question, and we had to think about that um, quite a bit. And um, I'm going to go back to that slide. Let's see where, um, so now I hope you see the slide where I'm showing the call, and we're measuring the, the tonal call of, this, of the blue whale. And now I, the, the thing is that the um, global increase in, in, in noise from ships is, is quite dramatic. I mean, we know that it's at least sort of 20 dBs more noise now than there was, um, you know, if you go back, say, 50 years or so, you know, when, and because of the dramatic increase in the numbers of ships. Now, the preponderance of ship noise is in the band below um, 100 hertz. And it, it, it's really the, the real peak of the ship noise is around, say, 40, say 20 to 40 hertz. So it's sort of in a band about like, about like this. Now the problem, now the problem with using that, using that, that as an explanation for the downshift, for the downshift is, that, is that that would that would mean that the animal is putting their sound energy, sound energy into the same, same band as the noise. As the noise. Because, because so, I, so I, I, would, I would, you know, you, you, know, you can't predict based on, based on where you know, where ship is, is, is that they be, they should their sound, sound, sound to yeah. higher frequencies, higher frequencies and lower frequencies. Lower frequencies. So, so, so it, it, it definitely, definitely makes, sense makes sense that they would be they would be back to that. But the sign, the sign is the wrong, is the wrong way. way. So, 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 you know, so, you know, we really, we really struggle struggle with what could be all of the things that contribute to this. And, 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 and I do believe, I do believe that, that, you know, you know that it is a significant factor that, that, that the animals, the animals are sensitive to that, that sound, sound, you know, of uh, ship noise, but, noise. But, but they certainly they wouldn't shift their, their songs down now to be on top of it. So, so it doesn't explain the shift, you know, the global shift. Good question, though. Okay, thank you, John. The audio was a little garbled there. How's my audio coming through? It sounds okay. good, Jim. Yeah, it sounds fine. I think just a little bandwidth issue. I think hopefully it'll be resolved shortly. Okay, I was able to understand him, but uh, it still was uh, um, a little garbled. So let me go yeah. back. Uh, John, do you know, is okay. there a way I can expand this question pane? It's a, I get like one line of text in the, in the pane. So yeah, you can. Through them. You can actually. There's a little arrow that indicates you can. You can over on the right hand top margin, it'll pop it out as a separate thing, and you can size it any, any big, as big as you want it. I can okay. actually pick up one of the next questions if you want. Uh, question uh, from okay. uh, Kate Faulkner uh, asking. Once, first of all, she says it's an excellent presentation, John. Do you have any thoughts as to the reason that the frequency of blue whale songs have become lower? Are you seeing this in other cetaceans as well? Um, well, I believe that we'll, we will find it. I, I think I've seen indications of it in fin whales, but I don't have as quantitative an estimate as we have uh, for blue whales. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it sort of speaks to the, the value of, of doing sort of long-term studies, because um, if you look at this, the plot that I have up, you know, that goes all the way back to the 60s, well, in the, when these recordings were made by the Navy, in the 60s, I mean, I was, I was in elementary school, uh, which I'm giving away my age right there. But you know, we there, there's value for having a document of you know what the animals have done, and um, and I, and I think it's 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 something that I wish I could fast forward 50 years from now because I believe at that point, if you look at the trend of this graph, it's such a steep downward trend. I mean, you know, in the in the year. 2040, they hit zero if they keep going. So it, something's got to happen, right? And, and and I hope that as it evolves over the next couple of decades, that it becomes absolutely clear. Um, and I mean, we've connected it to the um, the impact of the density of the animals from whaling. But but there can be other factors. I mean, I, I don't feel that we've really answered the question, you know, definitively at all. And I think it's just it really speaks to the value of having a long-term record, you know, it's like the way that um, in ecosystem studies in general, you know, if you don't have a baseline, it's kind of hard to know, you know, where you are. So, but but I, I think I think that it's in some other of the large whales, and particularly fin whales, and uh, maybe we'll be able to show that at some point. But but you know, it's it's got to be uh, resolved 
because you know they can't they can't keep doing this forever. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know if the end of the world happens when blue whale frequencies hit zero or something. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks, John. Here's another question. This one's from Scott Gendy. How do you test assumptions and account for detection probability for acoustic surveys for estimating abundance, similar to what you can do for visual surveys and distance sampling, double observers, etc.? Yeah, that's a really good question, and, and we're just starting to, to make uh, a quantitative use of, of the acoustic data. And we just had a paper, I think it's, uh, it's just out in endangered species research on using acoustic recordings in the Bering Sea to estimate the abundance of the North Pacific uh, right whale. And, and the, the right whale is, is a, the um, sort of poster child for endangered uh, large whales. I mean, there are only, you know, maybe 30 or so animals left. And, and we had recorders in the Bering Sea. And in that paper, we had to go to great lengths to figure out what is our probability of detection of the call versus range, you know, much like what you do in, in distance sampling. And, and then, um, you know, we, the, the, the weakness of the paper is that we only have a few sites. We only have, I don't know, three or four sites. We don't cover, you know, the whole area. But for those sites, we've done a, a, a really thorough job of saying that we know how far away the animal is uh, when we detect it, you know, the probability of detecting it versus range. And then you can use that to, to say, um, you know, to scale up to the larger area. So, so and, and the other issue there is, what is the probability of the, of the animal calling? And so we got that both from tagging data, not on the North Pacific right whale, but on the North Atlantic right whale. If you look at all the tag data and what, what fraction of the time, you know, in a certain window will the animals call. And then also by spending time near North Pacific right whales with uh, sauna buoys, you know, basically to, to monitor their sounds, and so, so those two factors, I think as we work those out, then we'll start to be more competitive with um, visual surveys as a, as a quantitative estimate. But, but, you know, we have to be careful. And when we did the, the um, assessment for North uh, Pacific right whales, the visual surveys and the acoustic number, and we didn't, you know, go too far out of the way to, to try to fudge this, but they came, you know, incredibly close to each other. Um, in terms of the numbers of animals, which is around sort of 30 animals. So, so and, th and that may be a special case because there's so few animals that um, it's kind of easier to do the, you know, call by call um, analysis. But, but we may get there with other things like blue whales or even dolphins. Great. Uh, I'm going to skip to one by Ian Williams here, a question that says, when whales are staying shallower during darkness, are they actually at the surface where they'd be more likely to be hit by a ship? Yeah, so let's, let's go back to, um, to that. Here's the, 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 uh, the dive record. And, and what we see is that they're not right at the surface, but close. They're within, say, uh, 10 meters or so of the surface most of the time. So I think this is their resting time, and they're coming up and taking a breath and then right back down. So, um, so, so yes, if you look at the overall rate at which they're at the surface, I mean, here when they're feeding, you know, they're kind of whatever that is, you know, five to ten minute gaps between surfacing times. And, and here the gaps between surfacing times are, are, um, are, are closer together, but, but they're not actually sort of logging at the surface. They're just up and taking a breath and then they they're hanging down here at sort of the 10 to 20 meter level. So, and, and maybe that was selected for animals that don't get whacked by ships, but, but you know, that, that's the behavior we see in the tag data. We did have another question then that was uh, just asking for your thoughts on acoustics and the incidence of ship strikes with blue whales off California. Yeah, well, uh, um, you know, it's been a concern because there's an overlap between the uh, um, sort of richest habitat for feeding, especially in the Santa Barbara area, you know, the Santa Barbara Channel and around the Channel Islands, is a really rich uh, area in terms of, of blue whale and humpback whales and others, you know, feeding. And it's also one of the densest uh, shipping areas on the, in the planet. And, um, and the, I have a student 
who's been working on this issue and tagging animals in and near the shipping lanes and then looking to see what the reaction is as the ship goes by. And, and unfortunately, it does look like the response of the animal tends to be to surface and spend more time at the surface when there's a loud sound. And that could be a reaction to the sound itself because at the surface, you, you're, you get an escape from the, the sound. The surface is a, a pressure relief. Um, so if you can put your ear basically right at the, at the you know, surface of the water, then the sound intensity goes way, way, way down. So, but, but that's kind of a, a sad uh, reaction. It was seen also in right whales on the East Coast. This was work done by some people at Duke where they would play a sound to the right whale, you know, a novel sound, and, and the response of the animal was quite often to pop up to the surface. So in, in there, you know, the, uh, the test was, could you put a sound-making device on the bow of a ship to alert the animal the ship is coming? Well, and, and the, the answer is that the response of the animal is exactly what you don't want it to do, which is to pop up to the surface. So, so that, that is something that needs some more study to figure out, um, you know, how the animals are responding to the ships and, and how the ships could, could behave or the sounds we could make from the ships to, to minimize the probability of the animal, you know, popping up in front of it. Very good. Thank you. Um, we've got just a few more questions here. And uh, do you still have a little time, John? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, so we'll go on with another one that says, do the different blue or yes, do the different blue whale songs that you showed represent different populations? Yes, I mean, I, we we you know you could call them acoustic stocks. I mean, we believe that those are uh, the the song is used as a cue for breeding, and um, and so you know that's that probably is you know in my humble opinion one of the better ways of of dividing blue whales into stocks. If you if you've gone to an IWC meeting, you know the International Whaling Commission, their stocks are based on longitude, which is really the convenience of the whalers. So if you start out in San Francisco and you capture whales on your way to the southern whaling ground, you would all be in the same stock, uh, or the same way if you you know leave from the UK, all the animals in the Atlantic would be in the same stock. But it really has nothing to do with the way the animals are organized. I mean, I think the sound is is one of the better ways to, of sorting out the stocks. And at this point, given that we've got these geographic areas that are, you know, illuminated by the song, people doing genetics can go back and test that, you know, do the genetics back up the distribution that we see from the sound. And so, so I think that'll be a really rich area for, there's a, a postdoc at uh, Southwest Fisheries here that's working on that, you know, as we speak. And so I think that's going to be a, a really good way to, to uh, learn about uh, whale stocks as, as we go forward. Okay, another question says, um, can you comment on the Navy uh, sonar acoustic experiments and the effect, if any, they have, had, they have on the whales? Well, there, there's the, the actual use of Navy sonar, and then uh, there's a, there are experiments the Navy has done to try to, to sort out the, the impact of the sonar. And, and in terms of um, the, the baleen whales, the the indications are, are kind of like what I described for the, um, you know, the ship sounds, that if the animal, this is, um, I'm involved in the, this is called the Southern California uh, 2010, there was an experiment, um, and Brandon Southall is the sort of overall head of the experiment, but I was involved in, in, in helping with the acoustics, and the response is that if the animal tends to be deep diving, there tends to be more of a response in terms of surfacing and that kind of thing than if the animal's at the surface. So, um, so I think, I mean, it's good to go through and sort out what the impacts of, of the use of sonar are. And the, there's a just training area where sonar is used quite a bit. And so in Southern California, there's an added aspect to this is that the animals are probably hearing these sounds quite frequently already. So, so um, you know, so there may be some level of habituation that might not be present in some other areas, just because this is an area where there's fairly intense uh, Navy training. Okay, we have just two more questions that I see here. John, we'll start with uh, this one, which is, how long do the tags stay attached to the animals? 
that's that's the hardest part is um, you know in in the bad cases you know for just a few seconds but in the best cases um, they've been on for a couple of days and we're trying to figure out how to improve that attachment I mean I I'm a fan of the suction cup attachment I mean it, it matches kind of the kind of questions we're asking there are longer term attachments that use implanted tags but it isn't appropriate for for the kind of stuff we're doing but but we're trying to learn you know there those suction cups are basically what you'd use to keep the roof rack um, on your car and so we're trying to see if there's slightly more advanced materials we could use on the suction cups to make that last a little longer but there are times when when the animals are are sloughing a lot of skin it's it's really hard to have anything stay on them i mean they're just seasons where they're shedding a lot of of the upper skin okay and finally um the question is, what is the level of international support for this initiative or this kind of research? Well, you know, the the U.S. has taken the lead, um, but there are there are parallel efforts in in Europe. There are quite a few groups now that are uh, doing you know more detailed acoustic work. Um, that's kind of you know in in some areas it's harder to have access to the sort of high tech. We need, you know, terabytes of disk storage and and you know uh, low power electronics that you can leave out for a long time. So I mean, I've done some collaborations with uh, colleagues in Latin America, and they're they're always you know very happy to include acoustics in part of their research. But it but it's hard for them to have as much access to the uh, computer technology that we do. So 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 I Europe is mostly where our you know competitors in other countries are are coming from. And collaborators. Great. Well, uh, I don't see any other questions uh, on the board at this moment. Um, so I want to thank you very much uh, for your time, Dr. Hildebrand, and thanks to all who attended and posed questions and so forth. We had a good, uh, a good number of you out there today listening in. Um, anything you want to say in closing? No, just thank you for having me. I'm I'm very happy to be part of your your online community. All right. Well, once again, folks, this was the very first of our series on uh, marine science and uh, ocean stewardship type issues, and we'll keep you informed uh, as to the next uh, webinars that are upcoming. We're going to do them about every quarter, so our next one will be in late June. And uh, that's all I have from this end. Unless John Morris, you have anything more for us technically, I think we can uh, sign off. We're good, Jim. Thanks. Well done. All right. Thanks for your help, everybody.